Funding for NJ Business Beat provided by New Jersey Chamber of Commerce, working to keep New Jersey in business. Online at njchamber.com. NJBIA has been the voice of business for more than 110 years and is built to serve our members in today's new normal. NJCU School of Business, a game-changing force offering programs like financial technology or business analytics and data science. We're steps away from the Exchange Place Path Train in Jersey City and minutes from Wall Street. Learn more at njcu.edu slash gamechanger. And IBEW Local 102, proudly serving New Jersey's business community since 1900. Local 102, lighting the path, leading the way. Visit IBEW102.org. This week on NJ Business Beat, open for business. Governor Murphy lifts major pandemic restrictions, but business leaders say it may not be enough. Plus, working more hours, but not getting paid for it. New research highlights workplace trends born out of the pandemic. And it's one of New Jersey's most critical industries. We put farming in focus, learning about how the next generation of farmers is advancing the trade and the opportunities available in the state. That's ahead on NJ Business Beat. This is NJ Business Beat with Rhonda Schaffler. Hello, I'm Rhonda Schaffler. Thanks for joining us on NJ Business Beat. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure you subscribe to our NJ Spotlight News YouTube channel to get alerted when we post new episodes and clips. New Jersey's business reopening is really happening. New capacity limits are in place this weekend and many more restrictions are being lifted later this month. Governor Murphy moved up his timetable for expanding indoor and outdoor capacity limits by a few days, just in time for this weekend. But the really big changes come in the middle of the month on May 19th. That's when many restrictions will be lifted entirely in New Jersey, New York, and Connecticut. Under the tri-state reopening plan, Capacity limits will be removed on indoor dining, gyms, casinos, salons, and other businesses, and there will be no limit on the number of people allowed to gather outdoors. Some restrictions will continue. Large indoor venues like sports arenas will be capped at 30% capacity, and indoor gatherings can have 250 people max. Social distancing is also still required. So are businesses happy about all this? You bet. Are they completely satisfied? Nope. To fill in the blanks, I spoke with Christina Renna, the president and CEO of the Chamber of Commerce of Southern New Jersey. Christina, this is the first weekend where we see some changes based on what the governor announced earlier in the week. How key is the lifting of restrictions for the businesses in South Jersey? Absolutely crucial, especially here in South Jersey. As we near the summer months, we need to start to see these guidelines broadening and reopening. And um, all that does with it is build the consumer confidence we need to get us in place for our strong summer season. Were businesses prepared to make the changes? Were there any hurdles that they have to deal with in terms of changing things around for capacity? At the end of the day, the business community has been through a lot over the course of the past year. So I think they really learned to be very flexible under the circumstances. We all saw the same COVID stats trending in the right direction. We saw the hospitalization numbers going down. We were hopeful that this kind of announcement would be coming. It was a bit of a surprise. We got a tease of it and then it dropped just a few days later. But generally speaking, after everything the business community went through last year, when there was really very little lead time uh, before reopening announcements, this is far better than that. And I think that having gone through it once last year, businesses were more prepared. But listen, more lead time is always better than less. So uh, we'll take what we could get. And again, very appreciative of the news that was given. But uh, if had we had a few more weeks, definitely from a staffing level, especially, that would have been um, a little bit more helpful for business. How optimistic are the businesses in South Jersey, particularly along the shore, about what the season's going to look like now? I will say that everyone is quite optimistic about the summer season. If you recall last year, 
uh, we were really reopening right around 4th of July, uh, the, right around that time period when, you know, the traditional start of the summer season is Memorial Day weekend. So we will be getting that full Memorial Day to Labor Day run that does uh, really encapsulate our tourism, our gaming, our hospitality, our restaurants uh, in the shore area. So definitely more optimistic than last year, but we still need to see further guidance and restrictions lifted to really maximize the economic benefit, not just for the business owners themselves, but also for the state and the revenues that those businesses produce. Ideally, what other restrictions would you like to see lifted then? At the end of the day, a restaurant or a bar will never truly be at 100% capacity, as the governor is saying, with social distancing in place. Because if you keep tables six feet apart, that is not their usual capacity. It is their max capacity with six feet of social distancing. So that limits your amount of seats around the bar and also, of course, the amount of tables in a restaurant. So again, all, all very good news, but those kinds of steps um, may be shortening and shrinking that, that social distancing requirements specifically for restaurants and bars would go a very long way to maximize the economic output of these businesses and their ability to succeed in the summer months. Christina, thank you so much. No, my pleasure. Thank you, Rhonda. Restrictions are being rolled back across the country, and that's giving the job market some pep. This week, New Jersey-based ADP reported that companies across the country hired 742,000 workers last month. But even as workers start new jobs or return to the office, they're feeling differently about things. I spoke with ADP's chief economist, Neela Richardson, about the pandemic's impact on the workforce. Neela, you recently put out a report that really looked at how much the workplace has changed over the past year. Let's talk about the state of the worker. There were some very interesting findings about pay and performance. Right, we spent over a year documenting changes to employment and the tremendous job loss. So this survey that was conducted between October and December of last year honed in on how workers felt about it. Um, and what we saw first and foremost, and this is very understandable, is that 85% of the global workforce, that's over 32,000 people in 17 countries, felt insecure about that, their jobs. And so that translated into a lot of different behaviors. And one of them was taking on more work and additional responsibilities. And people were taking on new work, but were they actually getting compensated for that? Well, there is some good news in terms of that. Yes, they were, but it's a mixed story. So about one in seven workers reported that they actually received some additional compensation, whether it was a promotion or a bonus. But uh, we also felt, saw that workers around the globe, this was a universally consistent result, were working more hours for free. So some of those additional responsibilities they were getting paid for, some they were not. And the incidence of working for free, unpaid work grew, especially here in North America. It doubled in the, in the course of a short one year period. So a mixed kind of result in terms of pay and performance over the last year. And so what has, has all of this done for workers' optimism and workers' feelings about their jobs? It does vary by age. Younger workers were the most affected by COVID-19. They experienced the greatest amount of job loss and pay cut. And so it's the young, that Gen Z, the newest age court to the cohort to the workforce, that has seen a reduction in optimism. The survey also looked at something we've been reporting on quite a bit, and that is some of the difficulties by gender. Women in particular have really struggled in the past year. Yeah, yeah. In fact, uh, a lot of commentators have called this the she recession because so many women have had to leave uh, the workplace because of uh, added family responsibilities with daycare closures and school closures around the the country in the US and around the world. And you definitely see it in the data. For one, we talked about people getting paid more for additional work, but men were more likely here in the US to be paid more, it's about 62%. Then women, only 50% uh, reported being paid more for additional responsibilities. Women were also less likely to feel confident that they could 
find a job with the same degree of flexibility, men were much more confident about that. So women tend to want to hold on to whatever flexibility they have um, and whatever pay they have because they see limited opportunities for change and improvement. And that's a key concern as we transition back to the workplace. Taylor, really fascinating uh, report. Thank you so much for sharing some of the high level findings with us. I appreciate it. Good to be with you. Thanks for having us. This time of year, there are a few New Jersey industries that really take off. Tourism, of course, is one of them. The other is New Jersey's agriculture industry. I mean, we are the garden state. Farming is in focus for us this week. We're looking at the next generation of New Jersey farmers and finding out what the state is doing to support family farms. First, some numbers that may surprise you. New Jersey is home to well over 9,800 farms, which generate more than $1 billion in revenue. Now this you may know, Jersey's top money-making crops are, my personal favorite, blueberries, the good old Jersey tomato, and bell peppers. Agriculture in New Jersey is at a crossroads though, as many farmers are nearing retirement, according to the Rutgers New Jersey Agricultural Experiment Station Cooperative Extension. Last weekend, the Cooperative Extension launched its Are You Ready to Farm program, which is for new and beginning farmers around the state. The director of that program says the state needs intelligent, energetic growers with great ideas to carry on the legacy of New Jersey's established successful farmers. Some of those intelligent farmers are already here, like John McConaughey, who founded Double Brook Farm in Hopewell Township. He ditched his Wall Street trading career for a different life, using his street smarts to turn his passion into a money-making adventure. So John, you became a farmer after spending part of your career on Wall Street. What made you chuck it all away and decide to turn to farming in New Jersey? There were a, a lot of things that happened after 2008. It just sort of made me think about uh, what we were doing and why we were doing it. And part of the, uh, the issue with finance is at the end of the day, there's not anything tangible. You can't touch it, you can't feel it, you can't smell it. Uh, and so the idea of having uh, a career where there's some tangibility, uh, something to, uh, to show the progress at the end of the day was, uh, was uh, an, uh, an appealing aspect of what uh, got us into farming. What was the toughest part about the transition? You know, interestingly, that it seems very different, uh, finance and farming. Uh, the reality is that uh, a lot of it's very similar uh, decision making. So we're making decisions on partial information. The weather's going to change. The animals are going to get sick. Uh, and so interestingly, the, um, the decision making wasn't so different than finance. Can you make a real decent living by a very dramatic career change like you did? Yeah, well, so when we started looking at uh, the economics of farming and what we were going to do, we decided that it made most sense to connect uh, all of the different pieces together. So I talked to local farmers and the issue that they had with, uh, uh, with their businesses was marketing and distribution. I talked to chefs and the issues that they had uh, was uh, sourcing and reliability uh, and consistency. Uh, and they were sort of the opposite of the, of the same problem. It, has taken us 10 years to put all those pieces together and figure out uh, uh, what are the bottlenecks, what are the problems. And the reality is when we first began this, what I thought were gonna be uh, the problems have turned out not to be uh, as big of an issue as I originally thought. And the things I thought were gonna be easy have been uh, relatively hard. To answer the question of how do you make farming profitable, uh, it is taking back some of the things that have been lost over the last 30 or 40 years, the processing, the distribution, um, uh, the trucking, the transportation, uh, and bringing it back to local. Do you love your job? I love the fact that we built a community that uh, didn't exist to the extent that it exists now. Uh, and I love having the freedom of being able to um, to take time out of my day if I need to, to go uh, experience uh, one of my kids' uh, sports, sporting events or um, 
spend time with the family. And so even though the days are as long, if not longer than the financial world, uh, the flexibility is a little bit different. John, thanks for your time. Thank you very much. The average age of a New Jersey farmer is 60. So you can understand why there's a move to groom younger farmers. And the next generation brings a lot to the table. They're embracing agricultural innovation and social media, which they use to bring in customers. There are people like Tim Bontoon, a 29-year-old fifth-generation farmer at Bontoon Farms in South Brunswick. Tim, obviously uh, being a farmer is in your blood and it's something your family's done for generations, but what is for you the excitement about starting a career in this industry? Um, like you said, it's something I grew up doing, always you know, helping out dad. Uh, from a young age, I was planting different crops and trying to you know, do some of my own things. Um, one of my favorite parts about farming is, is just, it's, it's something different every day. Um, we do a lot of different fruits and vegetables. Um, and so it's never the same thing two days in a row. And it's something that a lot of people, you think it's really easy. And there's actually a lot of science and there's a lot of business acumen and a lot of things that go into farming. And it's not, you know, quite just as simple as, 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 as it looks. There's a lot to it and kind of always keeps you thinking. Now, you're very deeply involved in New Jersey's Young Farmer Association. What are you hearing from people your age about how farming is changing and how this new generation is making it suitable for what they want to do? Um, I know a lot of people are kind of doing more with less now. Um, I know I've got some friends that are doing things with cut flowers or specialty fruits and vegetables. Um, so I know, you know, kind of 20, 30, 40 years ago, a lot of farms, if you didn't have 500 or 1,000 acres, you know, you couldn't really make it farming. Where nowadays you can have two or three acres and you can grow high value crops um, and you can make a living on that. And it's, uh, you know, it really has changed. And with here in New Jersey, we've got so many people and that can be annoying sometimes trying to drive a tractor down the road and you get people honking at you and trying to pass you. But at the same time, that's a customer base for us. And, you know, we wouldn't be here without all those customers. Um, and it, you know, it really, for as many people as around here, as many farmers that can be in the garden state, you know, we can all be supported because we have a huge population base all looking for, you know, fresh fruits and vegetables and things to come out to the farm and, and do on the farm. I think it's interesting, you know, for instance, perhaps your father or grandfather didn't think about this, but, you know, you're on Instagram, you're out there trying to reach people probably in ways that previous generations did not have available to them. Yes, no, it's definitely changed. Um, I know my dad used to say that we could tell how busy we might be based on how many phone calls we would get. And nowadays, you know, we can actually last year, a lot because of COVID, we were doing time tickets. And so we could know, you know, the day before pretty much how many tickets we had sold. There were days we were sold out ahead of time and we could plan our staffing and we would know, you know, how many, how many people were going to be at the farm. Um, and Facebook is, and Instagram is great because it lets us, um, you know, if something pops up and all of a sudden the strawberries were ready a week earlier, we can let our customers know, hey, strawberry picking starts today and we can get people out to the farm where in the past you'd have to set a, a newspaper ad and that might take two or three days and all of a sudden, you know, now you had strawberries that were ready that are now past their prime. Um, so it really, it's a great way for us to connect to our customers. Uh, we do some Facebook live videos. So we can show them kind of behind the scenes, what goes on going into uh, producing their stuff. Um, and it's great being able to interact with our customers and really show them and, and hear from them too. Well, Tim, it's been great chatting with you and hearing about what's happening at your farm. Best of luck with the uh, upcoming season. Thank you so much. To learn more about what's happening with farming around New Jersey, we spent some time with the state's Secretary of Agriculture, Douglas Fisher. He's working to preserve more of New Jersey's farmland while also promoting our local crops. How important is farming to New Jersey's economy overall? Well, it's very important. If, if you take agri-food, it's like $100 billion. If you take just the farm gate itself, that's the products that come right off of the farm. It's uh, over a billion dollars uh, just in raw product value. And then of course it gets uh, developed into other products, uh, foodstuffs and, and the like. Uh, so it's, it's, multi, it's a multi-billion dollar enterprise and important, very important to the state. What are some of the key initiatives that the state has right now to support our local family farms in New Jersey? What do we do? We, we promote. 
we make connections with farmers and end users uh, uh, to make sure that the products are received in their supermarkets and stores. We promote farmers markets. We do an advertising campaign. You'll see uh, any number of billboards this summer uh, across all the major arteries where we're uh, touting it. We also do a lot of social media work uh, and we are even gonna see planes. Yes, I think you saw them last year. If you were on the beach, you saw a plane fly over and talking about the Jersey Fresh Banner. So it's really a great marketing effort that uh, we want to make sure that we put ourselves front and center for the for the buying public. Where does New Jersey's farmland preservation program stand right now? Is that something, are we seeing a lot of farmland still being preserved or are we kind of past the peak of that? So, well, we definitely haven't passed the peak. We are actually one of the leading states in the country for farmland preservation. And in fact, have spent more money, that's how much New Jersey's, New Jersey's appreciate the farmland than any other state in preserving farmland. So where are we? We've preserved about 230,000 acres uh, and, uh, in the state. We'd like to get to a, to a base of about between 500, 550,000 acres. And we have applications from uh, all our counties, uh, municipalities uh, for another $280,000 for us to be able to fund, to preserve farmland, to, to take the pressures off from development. Because basically what we do is we buy the development rights. How optimistic are you that more New Jerseyans will decide to embrace farming? You know, we get a lot of interest and we have a lot of interest from young people. We also have a lot of people that they had a career in one, one part of their life, one phase of their life, and they actually want to return home and do farm and farm. So I'm, I'm very optimistic. Uh, we'll, we'll change what we grow. Some of the tactics that we use to, to get that product to market will change. Uh, but the public uh, has an unwavering demand uh, to be filled in terms of wanting local product. So I'm very optimistic. Well, it's been great talking to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Even if you haven't visited a farm lately, you may have stopped by your local farmer's market. Over the past few weeks, they've been reopening across the state and the crowds are there. These community gathering spots have also helped some foodies grow their businesses. Bob Conaway opened his store, Brownie Points Bakery in Summit after selling his sweets at the Summit Farmer's Market. Bob, you're one of these great farmer's market success stories. Tell us how you started to first sell your baked goods at a farmer's market and how it led you to where you are today. Uh, we started at the farmer's market in Summit in 2007. Um, where we were looking for, a, my partner and I were looking for a space to open a store. And we got a pretty quick following at the farmer's market in Summit and the next year a store became available. And in June of 2008, we opened a retail location in downtown Summit. So tell me about the farmer's market vibe. It seems that New Jerseyans have really embraced their farmer's markets. They love them. They love when they meet somebody like you and you know, you're know you offering something they didn't even know they needed. The farmer's market in Summit is a great market. It's one of the biggest ones in the state. We have about 42 vendors this year. So there's a great diversity of vendors at the market. Um, so, and we have a lot of customers that we only see at the market. A lot of customers we only see at the store. And then we also have gathered a lot of customers that we see in both places at the, you know, during the week. Some people will come to the store during the week and then come to the market on Sunday. It's just amazing. And uh, we've seen such a growth of farmers markets really up and down New Jersey. What do you think has driven the popularity of farmers markets? I think in the past, it's been a lot of just access to fresh local food. But in the last year or two with COVID, it's the experience of being able to shop outdoors. I think has really made a big impact. And this year, last year we noticed a lot of new people. There's been a lot of uh, influx of people into some of the surrounding areas from like Brooklyn, New York City, Hoboken, New Jersey City. So there's a different expectation from people who come from those places and a little more urban places on what they, what they wanna see. And then, you know, besides all the new people from last year, this year we've noticed in the first couple of weeks, a lot of the people that were afraid to come last year are now vaccinated. So all of them are also coming back this year again. So it's almost, you know, twice the amount of customers that we've had in the past. Do you ever see giving up the farmer's market stand or is just that something so integral in what you're doing? It's really integral to what we're doing. So I don't think we would ever do that. It's also really the closest you get to the customers. Like the one, one, we have a lot of regulars 
So you know, when they're walking up to the table, you know exactly what they want. And you know, we've really developed a good rapport with the farmers market customers, and we actually become friends with a lot of them. It's probably a fun way to spend the weekend too, for you personally, just to you know get out and about in the fresh air and and meeting uh, new and old customers. It is it's it's great. You know, it's a really early start on Sunday. We get up at four for the farmers market, but it is a good it is a good way to be outside and enjoy the the, the outside too on Sundays. Wow, you absolutely love it if you're up at 4 a.m. on a weekend morning. That is impressive. Well, Bob, enjoy the season and uh, best of luck to your business this year. Thank you. And that wraps up our show for this week. Thank you for watching. I'm Rhonda Schapler. We'll see you next week. Funding for NJ Business Beat provided by New Jersey Chamber of Commerce, working to keep New Jersey in business. Online at njchamber.com. NJBIA has been the voice of business for more than 110 years and is built to serve our members in today's new normal. NJCU School of Business, a game-changing force offering programs like financial technology or business analytics and data science. We're steps away from the Exchange Place PATH train in Jersey City and minutes from Wall Street. Learn more at njcu.edu slash gamechanger. And IBEW Local 102, proudly serving New Jersey's business community since 1900. Local 102, lighting the path, leading the way. Visit IBEW102.org.